All right, so today we're in conversation with Stefan Woodborn, AMS scientist at the Tandem Accelerator Facility up in Johannesburg. Stefan, before we get to all of that, science, how did you get into science? I wanted to be an archaeologist and my parents wanted me to be an engineer, so it was somewhere between making money and following your passion. And so I followed my passion and I did archaeology, which was great. I really enjoyed it. It was great field work, really understanding the prehistory of South Africa. But in the course of doing that, I started working in the, the stable isotope laboratory and then later on in the radiocarbon laboratory. And that exposed me to a whole lot of new dimensions of science. I was working with geologists and various people who were trying to understand what was going on in the world around us. And that just gripped me. I'm just inherently the kind of person who wants to know how things work. So if it's my car, I'll, I'll work out how it works. And if it's how the world works, how our climate system works, how our ecology works, it just intrigues me. And so I just find the whole science domain to be such an obvious route for me to be. So it sounds like curiosity is part of your life, but what exactly is AMS? So AMS is accelerator mass spectrometry. It's the technique that we use for measuring very rare isotopes. The most common example is the isotope carbon-14. The abundance of carbon-14 is about one in a trillion atoms. And so measuring the abundance of carbon-14 is a very challenging uh, technique. We need to use a particle accelerator to get enough energy onto the particles to be able to detect them. And then once you've detected the carbon-14, it's a radioactive element, the abundance of the radioactive element tells us how long it's been in existence. So we use it for understanding things like the age of archaeological materials, but we also use it for understanding the way that the Earth's carbon system works. So the way that the, the Earth's carbon metabolism works, where is carbon being absorbed, where is it being generated in, in the Earth's system. Stefan, where does AMS fit into our understanding of climate change? I'm using AMS as a dating technique to find out the age of trees. Now, in Southern Africa, our trees don't grow the way that they do in Europe. In Europe, you can look at the tree rings, count them, and that gives you the age. The width of the ring also gives you the climatic conditions under which the tree grew. We don't have that option, and so we generate the age of the trees by doing AMS radiocarbon dating. And then we do stable light isotope measurements, so the chemical composition of the wood to give us an indication of how wet or dry it was when that wood grew. So if I've been working on baobab, a baobab might grow for a thousand years and locked away in that wood is a thousand year record of the rainfall. Now using this we've been able to reconstruct rainfall all the way from Angola through to Madagascar and by seeing how at any point in space how rainfall has varied we can look at the whole trajectory of our climate system, does it get more rain in the east than in the west, in the north and south? And, and what are the dynamics that sits behind that? And so using this approach where we get the space-time reconstruction of rainfall in the past, we then get a kind of spatial map of how rainfall has varied. We can then run the climate models, which we are using to forecast future climate change, we can run them for the last thousand years to see whether or not they, they give us the right answer. By doing this, we've seen that every single variable that we're seeing in our paleo record of, of rainfall from trees is being correctly replicated in the climate models, which then gives us a lot of confidence in what the climate models are forecasting for the future. Does the data give you any indication of the possible impact of human intervention or industrial revolution? Uh, absolutely. That's, that's one of the factors that we need to tease out with the industrial revolution and our, our lifestyle at the moment, we're, we're generating a, a lot of carbon dioxide. And as the carbon dioxide increases in the atmosphere, the trees feel this. So where do crocodiles fit into your field of study? This started out uh, with um, a, a, an epidemic of a disease called pansteatitis, which killed off a large number of crocodiles in Kruger National Park. And it's a dietary disease. And so we were trying to reconstruct the diet of crocodiles using stable light isotopes. But the approach is a very synchronic 
technique. So you can measure the stable isotopes of crocodiles now, and it tells you what they were eating now. Um, the problem is that the pansteatitis epidemic took place a few years before we started getting involved in the science. So we had to have a way of looking back in time. And so we decided to analyze the isotope uh, record that is found in the claws of the crocodiles. Now, the, the crocodile claws grow in much the same way that our, our fingernails grow. So they represent growth over a certain period of time and we could measure the isotopes along that time series. And so from that, we could reconstruct what the crocodiles were, were eating. But it was important for us to calibrate the technique. And so we were able to apply AMS radiocarbon dating to the claws to see the age of the different layers within the claw to calibrate the, the technique. From what you're sharing, clearly, you know, science shows up in, in different places, whether it's crocodile toenails or whether it's trees. And yet we find that there are many young people out there feel that science is probably not for them or there's no hope through science. Any, any final word to those kind of students? I believe that science is, first of all, a passion. And it's the kind of thing that in order to succeed, you need to have a passion for it. And that passion overcomes all of the reasons why one believes that you shouldn't do science. There's a, there's a million reasons why you might feel that you shouldn't do science. But my parents didn't think that I should do science. They were asking me, when are you going to get a job? And you know, when are you going to do something useful? Um, but when, when you start getting involved in research that makes a difference, the, the reward is no longer the extrinsic reward. It's no longer about the, how much money do you earn. It's about what impact do you have with the science. And that can be everything from the, the ecological processes that you understand, the students that you work with, the, the quality of the researchers that you collaborate with, all the way through to the impact that you have on society at a policy level. Stefan, I don't know what else to say except thank you. I mean, thank you for sharing your passion, your love for science, and, and just reminding us that, you know, it's important for things to be relevant. And if things are relevant, then hopefully your passion will be okay. I think that that's an important message to to the youth of South Africa. You know, we are in the process of overcoming all kinds of legacy problems, and science is a big part of what our future uh, will hold. If we want to have a positive future, we need to be deploying the best brains in our country uh, to deal with these problems so that we have a better future. There you have it. You call him Stefan, I call him Crocodile Dutch. <laughs>